Hey folks, it's your main man Sabado. If you've been here before, um, welcome back. If you haven't been here before, welcome to the channel. Uh, it's a channel where we talk about my journey of financial independence and I had the opportunity to retire at the age of 51 and all I do is talk to you about that and, and hope that it, in some way you can glean some, some knowledge or inspiration from my experience and hopefully find you uh, living your best life at the at the at the time that that, uh, that you decide because again it's, it's your life you should make those decisions and um, you know I think we go our whole lives with uh, people telling us what we can and what we can't do and I think that uh, I think work is no exception and so this it's an opportunity now for us to uh, learn from others and, and take what others have done to, to help us get to where it is we need to go and I just am here to, to help with that. So um, on that note, uh, let's go ahead and talk about um, kind of how I worked. Um, when I worked, you look at people that retire early and you have this, there's this impression that we've been these money hungry individuals that were just going after the job, the increase, the money, and, and then get to a point um, to where we retire early. And, and yeah, that's just not the case. Um, so I thought the easiest way for me to help illustrate my path and, and the, the impetus for different decisions that I made was to walk you through that. Um, you know, I have nothing to hide here and uh, I think it's important to understand the thought process because I, I, I you know, it's funny, I, I, I guarantee you that there's some of you out there right now that are going into jobs every day that are painful to go into and the issues that you have aren't even money you know we tend to think that they're money we tend to think of them as being you know more money makes things easier but it really doesn't and if you you know i used to say as an hr executive that you hire people for what they know and you fire them for who they are because everything that you fire somebody for those are all behavioral characteristics that show you the character of the individual that you're firing um, and again there are people that are um, they are uh, inappropriately terminated, so this does not obviously does not uh, relate to them. But for people that that um, engage in bad behavior, it's because they made the choice to engage in bad behavior. And then people that don't engage in bad behavior, a lot of times, just aren't making the choice to do that. That's all I'm saying. So, um, and for many of you, you know that I ended my career as the uh, chief human resources officer, and so. There's a lot that I see from behind the scenes that a lot of other people don't see. So, uh, but when I started, I started as a uh, as a in the recruitment track. I started off as a as a recruiting assistant. I'm sorry, recruiting. Uh, yeah, recruiting is a recruitment assistant, working for a fairly large uh, networking company. And then I saw that uh, there was an opportunity to grow, um, and so I saw the opportunity to grow and become an, a full fledged recruiter. So I left that and became an agency recruiter and, you know, and basically what they call a headhunter. And um, I would call people, talk to them about what they're currently doing and see if they're interested in finding work and help them uh, with one of the jobs that we had available. I mean, this was all during the during the dot com boom. So, it was, you know, there were a lot of jobs out there, but it was about matching the right people to the right opportunities. Um, and then. I realized very quickly that working in a, in a small agency, you know, you're going to get some exposure, but you're going to be limiting your exposure and you're going to be typecast as an agency recruiter. And so I wanted to go to a bigger pond. Um, and so I had a, a colleague of mine, a guy named Ed, told me that um, there were some of the larger organizations looking for an in-house contract recruiter. And so the difference between an agency recruiter is that age recruiters are headhunters, they work for agencies, then you have in-house contract recruiters, which are hired guns. And so they're, so an organization might say, we have 10,000, we need to hire 10,000 software engineers. So they don't, their internal people aren't gonna be able to handle that load, so they hire hired guns, contract recruiters, which were people like me. And so it gave people like me an opportunity to go into a bigger pond, recruit, understand how things work, so then I could leave that and do something else, but without the long time commitment. Um, so as, as things go, did that for a while and it was great. Had a great time uh, as an agency recruiter, made a lot of money, uh, because when you're an agency recruiter, I'm sorry, when you're a corporate recruiter, um, you're getting paid by the hour 
you're not getting benefits and stuff. And so your hourly rate is a little bit higher. And so, you know, it's great because then you're making a bunch of money doing something that you that you're fairly good at. And, you know, there is a challenge of having to take care of your own stuff, um, you know, in terms of paying your uh, paying for your health care and putting money away for retirement and stuff like that. But you're getting these big checks. So it makes it a little easier. You know, they say money doesn't buy happiness, but it makes a lot of things a lot easier. So it certainly made that a lot easier. But there is something to be said for stability. And so once we got to the tail end of this, the, this mega hiring that we were doing, I uh, was looking for some st- stability, and I was it was for, I was fortunate enough that the organization that I was I'd been working with um, was moving towards a more stable recruitment environment. At least so I thought. And so they went from having a bunch of contract recruiters to taking the best of the best, which yours truly was part of that pool, which I'm happy for, and eternally grateful for, and hiring them into the marathon because contract recruiting is like the sprint in-house um, recruiting, corporate recruiting is like the marathon. And so they hired me in. But unfortunately, and I had some of that stability. And so you, as you start to see growth opportunity, uh, gaining exposure in a bigger pond to make more money, um, the uh, having more stability, you know, those are all reasons that are really not financial in their in their base for why I, see, I sought out new... Um, new opportunities and then i got laid off you know this takes you back just to give you some perspective this takes you back to about 2001 so 2001 you had all the technology technology was the top of the world i mean even more so than this ai stuff is now i mean uh, this is before the tech boom most people didn't have computers in their houses after the tech boom everybody had a computer in their house so so was that that was the size and scale of it and the tech boom certainly uh, predated me, uh, but there was there was a lot going on. So I got laid off, and when I got laid off, I had to figure it out. I, I said, okay, I, I got a new kid. I had a new baby at the time. Uh, I just bought a house. Um, you know, I had some expenses, and you know, I was young, and and so I didn't have the life experience to necessarily understand the, the ebbs and flows of these types of situations. But the one thing I did know is that I was going to have to pivot. I was going to have to find a way to continue to make some money because at this point. Retire, like for many of you, retirement wasn't the the wasn't in the picture for me. What it what I was thinking about was how am I gonna feed my family, and so um, so then I, I did a lot of thinking. And you know, it's funny. I, I'll digress here for a second, but uh, you know, you hear a lot of people uh, with like different cliches, and they say it's better to find a job when you have a job, and all that kind of stuff. And and I tend to agree with that, except for one point. Um, when you when you have a job, then you're caught up in the rigmarole, and you don't necessarily have the time to try to figure things out. When you uh, are out of a job, or when you're not working, it's great because then you have time to really do an assessment and inventory of, of your skills and what you are and what you could bring to the table. And if you do that right, you could bring that back and really uh, sell yourself in a major way um, in an organization. Which is what I like to think I did is. Uh, um, I went back, uh, pivoted, uh, and moved myself into the HR generalist track. So I moved away from the recruitment track and just went into what most people consider just kind of mainstream HR. I went into that track. Now, let me tell you that my first job, I was an HR manager, and I took about a 40% pay cut in order to take that job. Again, we're still at the end of a recession here. I took a 40% pay cut. Hired guns get paid a huge hourly rate up front, but it's for a short duration. Um, when you take jobs like HR managers, not for the high, you're not a hired gun. You're there for the long run, and so you're going to get paid less, but you're going to get benefits and retirement, all these different types of uh, benefits that come with it. So, I took that position, and I was fortunate enough to uh, have gotten some increases and, and done some nice things there. But I tell you what's what's kind of interesting is I took this took this position, and um, then. You know, at some point, maybe a year later, I got a uh, an increase, and it was an eight thousand dollar increase. But I, I started to feel that same thing I felt at the recruitment agency, where I felt like I was a big fish um, in a small pond, and I and I knew that my my prospects were going to be limited. And so, what I what I decided to do was take a look outward just to see how my uh, skills 
can uh, can help. So I had gotten this increase, and then I get a call from a large logistics organization. And the position that I took was actually a step backwards um, compared to this position that I was that I was currently in. But the promise in the future, the upside was a lot bigger. And so what's interesting is, you know, I mentioned I, I got that $8,000 increase at the previous job. Well, I lost that $8,000 increase by taking the new job because the new job was going to was not going to pay me that. And, you know, I was a little frustrated, but I had to make a choice. Do I make the choice for growth long term or do I make the choice for having a couple more dollars in my pocket? Which, again, I think for some of us. You know, it's not a choice that we can make. And I was fortunate enough to be able to make that choice or I was dumb enough to to make that choice uh, hoping that I I did better. And so I ended up taking a position and it was at a warehouse and I had, you know, a bunch of people in a warehouse, maybe 70, 100 people, 150 people in a warehouse that I was responsible for. Uh, But what was what was interesting, I had the opportunity to meet some people there that I didn't have the opportunity to meet at my last job. So I met the senior vice president of HR for the Americas, met the senior uh, senior vice president of HR for the consumer sector. Then I had my I had two bosses that I that I worked for that I had the opportunity to uh, to meet. And and what was nice is by be, the one of the first questions they all asked me after about being there a month is they asked me about the business. You know, how's the business operate? So I laid out how the business operates, not you know, how we do paperwork and things like that, because as an HR person, I was never interested in that anyway. I, th- I always thought there was there was more to it. So I had those conversations. Long story short, uh, they were fairly impressed because they were happy that there was an HR person that had the ambition not just to be uh, a, a top-notch HR professional, but do it the right way by learning the business and the operations. And so I had the opportunity to gain some additional exposure, um, was... Re- eventually promoted to re, to be responsible for that whole uh, region and then I took on some learning and development responsibility but the the challenge that I ran into and this happens to a lot of people tell me if this happens to you because if it's just me then I'll, I'll go cry myself a river <laughs> but um, the one thing that happened to me is that there was one individual that uh, really became my mentor and uh, good 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 dude you know but anyway it almost became like I was encapsulated by him. And so the question in my mind became, am I being, am I successful because of him or am I successful on my own merits? And the only way that I'm going to know whether I'm, I'm successful on my own merits is by venturing out. And so I, so I found a position where I had regional responsibility, again, broader responsibility. So this time I had about 300 operating locations across 23 Western states. So now it's a big, even bigger um, organization or a bigger opportunity uh, within the organization, and um, and it was great because uh, I was I was there for a number of years. The boss that hired me ended up leaving, and then the new person that came in was a tyrant. And it just and and at the same time, I was going through some changes in my life that I needed to really focus on, and, and so I needed something that was a little bit that made a little bit more sense uh, to me uh, than working for a tyrant. And it just turned out that some of the work that I had been working on. Uh, at my previous job um, with some of the learning and development stuff really kicked off. And so they called me back to help do some quantitative measurement on the effectiveness on some of the learning uh, work that was being done and also to lead some of the learning and development efforts um, for our, uh, Canada and, and Puerto Rico uh, operations. And so I was able to I was able to do that. And so again, I left that job because I had the opportunity to do something bigger. So I was able to specialize, but in a really big piece of the puzzle of a global organization. So, uh, so that was, that was great. That, and, and with that, I was, I was moving around the country doing a lot of different things, but moving the needle forward, um, really focusing on, uh, growing, uh, the programs, growing, um, the leadership develop the skill set, the leadership skill sets across the organization, uh, because a lot of the learning and development was the, was the leadership stuff. So I had the real opportunity to have to have a real impact in the organization. But the the challenge was that um, in order to effectively do this job, and and the last year I worked there, I was on the road working for um, forty weeks a year, and so 
Um, you know, when you, when you think about a 52 week year, then you think about weeks off for holidays and vacations and so on. I was on the road traveling for 40 of those 40 or 52 weeks. And so that was tough because I had other responsibilities I had to take care of. And again, I'd mentioned I'd gone through some life changes. And so my daughter was, uh, was living with me and I needed to make sure that I was there for her, uh, cause she's the most important piece of the entire puzzle for me. And, um, so I took a job in a, in a local organization doing a piece of HR that was different than what I'd been working on. So I'd been working on HR generalists and learning and development and recruitment and those types of things. And then there's the whole union perspective. And so I wanted to understand how to work with unions in a different way. And so I took a, uh, again, I took a pay cut um in order to take this role and I took a couple of steps backwards now I'll tell you something that's interesting is that I took a uh, when I when I not only did I take a pay cut when I took this job but it was also in March and the reason that March was so significant is that in April that's when bonuses were going to be paid out and our bonuses that year were about 35% of our base salary. So without going into the amount of money that I was making, thirty if you took whatever you make and you add 35% on top of that as free money, that's pretty significant free money. Uh, but I, I had to make a choice. I either stick around for the free money and continue to be uh, feel the way that I felt, or I take this new role and I gain some new skill sets. I'm at home. I tell, I'm able to take care of my family in the way that I need to take care of my family. And things work out better. Well, you know, I, I hope the obvious choice to you was that he um, chose to uh, to take the position where he could stay home with his family because it's that's the most important thing because that's exactly what I did. So I walked away from this 35% bonus took a lower salary, walked away from the bonus, all so I can, um, so I can uh, continue to grow, be around my family. Because again, if I, I knew that if I didn't um, take care of my business, then everything would crumble around me ahead of time. So it took some took some foresight to do that. Um, and then I, while I was while I was there, I was, I was doing my thing, and it's and it's funny because. One of the I had the opportunity to to go to an event with somebody, and one of the things that um, the head person from this organization said, one of the head people, and it's a large healthcare organization, said that I was a uh, like the the labor guru. So dealing with the unions, I was the guru in dealing with the unions, and I don't. And it's it's because you know again when you're when you're on the company side you're making deals and and my thing is is I don't play games I just try to do things that make sense so if it makes sense we can have a conversation if it doesn't make sense then we're not going to waste each other's time because then we're going to get frustrated and do something we really don't want to do so again it it worked out the way that it needed to work out um, and then a couple years after that I get a phone call from somebody that I worked with this organization and. She told me that there was a position as a director of HR for the two hospitals, um, two hospitals in, a, in the next town over, and I'd be responsible for both of them. And so I went and did that. Um, and you know, again, it was growth. It was, it was telling, it was taking me to that point in my career where I'd been working up to this point, though I didn't know I was working up to this point. I was working up to this point, and then I get to this point. And, you know, they say uh, luck is when preparation meets opportunity. So I was the opportunity came and I was prepared because I'd been doing all the work up to that point to, to get myself there. And then uh, so then we were so I, I took that. I took the position was there for a few years. And, you know, and this this is around the time that my wife and I just a few years before that was when my wife and I started talking to a financial advisor and, and some of that. So. We ended up as the as we started to wind down towards thinking about where we would want to live long term and then maybe just traveling into a city. We found our current city um, and then I got a position um, offered that for the chief human resources officer. And what's interesting is that the cost of living between the two towns is significant. 
And so when I gave my salary expectations for the new job uh, for the chief HR officer, because they were in a town that had lower uh, expect, I'm sorry, uh, lower uh, had a lower cost of living. I quoted my salary requirements as being about sixty thousand dollars less than what I was making at that job. Now, funny thing was, is that on top of having the job in the other town, my wife and I were both traveling to that town. We were staying. We had an apartment in that town. We'd have to get food in that town. We had a whole infrastructure in that other town, so that way we could work there and then come home to here. So, if, you know, so when you when I say sixty thousand dollars, it sounds like oh my god, a shock to the system, but it really wasn't that when you consider the cost of living in uh, another city. So, and then it then it ended as a as a. Uh, I ended up in that last job as a, as a chief HR officer, and it was interesting because I think I mentioned that you know in my in this last job, and, and this is there's the irony here is that I found out that jobs in this town that I went to go work in actually do pay commensurate to what this other town was paying, but he didn't mention to say that, and then when I mentioned it to him, um, you know he he danced around, played a bunch of games, and so by the time uh, he came back around and said, you know, we're going to go ahead and make the change I had already resigned my fact to the myself to the fact that it was time for me to go and you know looking for other jobs once you once you've had a job as a as a chief executive uh, it's hard to go back to a job where now you're going to go back and, and work for people that used to work for you I know and, and let me know I'm sure that's happened to other people let me know what your experiences were but I it just seems like it's uh, it's not a bunch of ego stuff. It's just one of those things because you know I'm I'm used to developing the strategy. I'm used to putting together the plan. I'm used to having the conversation. So somebody just telling me here's what I need you to do, then that's a whole nother. I just I just wasn't into that. So that's that's where I ended. So it's, it, the irony is is you know when you when you look at why I've uh, changed jobs and you look at what's happened financially, you know I growth opportunity. Uh, bigger pond, more stability, got laid off, um, more opportunity, um, you know, and then to get to the end to find out that I left largely because my uh, what what got me thinking about leaving in that moment was the fact that my boss didn't take care of things financially he tells me that the the money you know money is important so don't don't get me wrong money is important you get money is the vehicle for you to do the things that you need to do it's less about the money that you make and more with how the people that are managing the money deal with the money so let me give you an example of what i mean there's a lot of people that say, well, you know, you uh, you you accepted a job at this amount, and so, um, you know, you have nothing to complain about. I said, you know, you're right. I didn't complain. I just said that the market for this job pays this. I was under the impression that the market paid that. And so if you were to hire somebody else, then you would have to pay this. And so I think I should be brought commiserate with this or close to it and so what's interesting is I laid out a logic he laid a logic out back he played games with his logic I've since left and they haven't been able to hire anybody else into that job and when I left I told them that they couldn't afford another me so I was right so it's funny how money um you know, when you when you look at when you look at um, you know what makes what's what's most important to people, money's not the most important thing. Money's like uh, you know, money's a satisfier or a dissatisfier. But you know, I was motivated when I went into the job. I was I was motivated the whole time. I wasn't motivated by the money. The money was just. But if you play games with the money, then it's certainly going to be a problem. And I think that's the way it is with most of you. 
you know, it's a hard conversation because then you get pigeonholed as, oh, money's just the most important thing. It's like, well, no, it's not. But if you play games about money, that's a problem because then I can't trust you to take care of something that's responsive, that's important for me. And so that's that's the point when I realize that if I'm able to go, it's, it's time for me to go because it's the older I get, the less patience I have. And the less patience I have, the more direct I become. And the more direct I become, the easier it is to hurt people's feelings. And I'm just not in that in that place right now. But, you know, as you could see, there, there's... You know, there there were some constants that, as you as you heard this story, that I think resonate. And I think number one is that money was never the number one deciding point for any of the moves that I made. I never made a money uh, a move to or from a job because of the money, uh, because the money can can come and go. Because the happiness doesn't come from money. You know, they say money doesn't buy happiness. It doesn't, but it makes some things easier. You notice I say some things, not everything. Um, you know, for me, and this was ingrained in me by my father, is that work was always a means to make money or a vehicle to make money, but not define who I am. So I'm not Sabado, the HR guy. I'm Sabado, a guy that happened to work in HR. You see, so there's, there's a huge difference. And you should never let something that you don't have control over, something on the outside world, control who you are as a person. Because let's say, for example, uh, HR people are these great people, love HR people. Oh, HR people, which I know is not true. So you can express all your love for HR people in the comments. But let's just say, for example, America loves HR people. Then an HR person does something nefarious and it's in the news. Now, all of a sudden, HR people are horrible. So now, does that make you horrible because somebody else did something stupid? No. So, again, don't let things that you don't have control over define you. Um, you know, the other thing I did is I always put a little bit of money into my 401k. Um, now, I didn't always keep it there. Um, when I bought my first house, when I bought my second house, the way that I funded my um, um down payments was largely through my 401k and i'm talking i withdrew i didn't take a loan out. i withdrew from my 401ks but i always um put money into those 401ks and you know there's other ways to save money as well and and i i was i was reading something the other day and they were talking about how you know they don't agree with the idea of pay yourself first and but they'll say that, you know, your check after all your deductions, including 401k deductions. And so when I talk about paying yourself first, I always think about paying yourself first in terms of putting money into retirement, which is your 401ks and so on. But I always put a little bit of money away on all the time, even if it was $20, because what happens is the market goes down. People are afraid. They say, I'm not going to put money in markets. Then the markets go up. They're like, oh, my goodness, I want to go in the market. But the problem is, is that if you put money in the market when the market's already up, then there's only one way it can go, which is down. And so you run into, you know, you run into that situation. So I always put money in my 401ks. And a lot of that's, again, going back to the book that I read, The Nine Steps to Financial Freedom by Susie Orman. And if anybody has any questions about that book, uh, let me know. I'll, I'll make sure we can. We'll I will find out where you can get a copy. Um, and I didn't let other people make my decisions. You know, it's it's funny when you work at a when you work at a place and you have a mentor, you have somebody that, that takes you under their wing. A lot of times, they feel like they own you, and you know they feel like they have um, um, like a special license to say and do certain things or. And, that should, and and to talk you out of doing things that are the best for you. And I, I just never gave that up to anybody. Um, there's, only, there's only about five people in my in my entire life that have the ability to make, uh, you know, life-changing decisions for me. And none of them are, uh, are work-related. So, uh, you know, so I never let other people make their decisions for me. And then the last constant is I always sought out new financial information. You know, I never, I never claimed, even on this channel, I never claimed to have all the answers, and I don't, I never claimed to know everything. I never even claimed to know half of any everything. But what I always do is try to seek out the information. Let me try to understand. You know, I was just watching something this morning talking about life insurance, and I was like, oh, let me take a look at how people were using life insurance, like investments, and some of those things. I'm not saying I'm going to do it, but I like to know that it exists because I, I don't think it's always about knowing all the answers. It's about being able to ask good questions and so my goal is always to make sure i know enough to be able to ask the intelligent question about whatever the topic is so so that's uh about all i had for today i just wanted to you know i, I thought i would share with you a little bit about 
my journey and, and how I work because you know it's it's easy to get in. A lot of people have a lot of opinions about people that retire early and where they get their money from and how they handle their business and how they handle their life. And, you know, unfortunately, most of what I read and most of what I hear is wrong because it's, you know, and I say that because I'm I'm not that guy. And, um, you know, and a, and a lot of people like to argue about this, that, and yes. Say, okay, that's fine. But um, I retired at 51 because these are the things that I did. So they, I'm not saying that they work for everybody, but, it, but there's, but everything that everybody has ever told me hasn't always worked for me either. So there's always going to be these different pieces of information that you have the ability to choose from. And the key is, is making sure you put yourself in, in a place for all that information to be heard. And so, you know, so I've always been on the lookout for new financial information, trying to understand how things work, trying to understand how money works, because I think most Americans don't know how money works, which is why you get so much confusion in the with the stock market dynamics and, and all of those uh, different um, pieces of information. So so that's, again, as I, I mentioned it before, and I, again, I promise this time I, it's it's true. Uh, I've, I've, said, I've gotten to the end of about what I had. I do want to ask, though, that if this content was helpful for you anyway, please uh, feel free to uh, subscribe. I, you know, I'm, I, I, I try to, uh, and if you, uh, if you have questions or comments, leave them in the comments because I try to respond to, to all the comments. And and please, if you if you have a comment, keep it constructive. We're not here to tear anybody down. We're not here to make any point except for the point that helps other people. Um, get to the place where they're living their best life. Because again, I, I realize a lot of people may not have it in their viewpoint to retire, but I do think most people want to live the best life they can live. And, and that's really all we're talking about. So I think that's about all I had. Um, if you have any questions, leave me leave them in the comments. Um, and I look forward to talking to you soon. Have a good rest of your day and talk to you soon.